Good morning. Good morning. The scripture reading this morning is Matthew 4, 12 through 23. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. So that what had spoken through the prophet Isaiah must, might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region, and shadow of death light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of De Zebedee, and his brother John in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. May God add a blessing to the reading of these words. Some of you may remember a few months ago that I shared a box of letters that I found that had been saved by my mother. And after she died, the box was passed on to me. And in that box, among other things, were several letters that my mom had saved from me when I was a college freshman. And y'all remember, this was a long, long time ago. This was before you had cell phones. It was before you had any kind of email. I, I sent letters. I mean, lots and lots of letters. So, and so as we begin this morning, I'd like to share a portion of that letter that was written to my family in October 27th, 1976. It was just a few weeks before my 18th birthday, so I was still 17 years old, y'all. This is what it says. I had been wrestling with God over something. I've really been seeking to do God's will with my life, and as you know, I was willing to do just about anything that God told me to do except one thing, to be a missionary. Well, guess what? God is calling me to be a missionary, <laughs> I've been trying to rationalize the reasons why I shouldn't be a missionary, like I'm not good enough or I'm just not strong enough. I guess what I most am scared of is what the sacrifices I would have to make if I became a missionary. Now, spoiler alert, I never became a missionary. <laughs> you already know that. But I wonder how many of us have ever felt a nudge just a, a tug, a little feeling that God had something for us to do, something perhaps that caused us to doubt, to struggle, or perhaps even experience fear over what it would require of us. As we consider the call from Jesus to follow me, I want to invite you now to join me in a word of prayer. Loving and gracious God, we thank you for your presence that is here with us today. And I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts might be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. For you, O oh God, are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So as we begin looking again at our text for today, before the part where Jesus actually is calling the disciples, there are a number of things about the person and ministry of Jesus that we find in the Gospel of Matthew that are important for us to know. After all, if you're following somebody, you need to understand who and what it is that you are following. So let's look at Matthew and how his portrait of Jesus is described. First, we see that Jesus' ministry is aligned with God's purpose that is revealed in the Hebrew Bible. That is the Bible before the time of Christ. And that's, let's understand that this is very important and intentional. 
in Matthew's gospel because part of his purpose in writing is to verify that the Jesus movement is not a departure from Judaism, but rather a fulfillment of Jewish faith and tradition. This happens over a dozen times in Matthew, and in our text today we learn that after John's arrest, Jesus leaves the Judean wilderness where he's been tempted by the devil and settles in Capernaum so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. And it's there in Capernaum that Jesus begins his ministry with the same message as John the Baptist, a message of repentance, of turning one's direction away from the things that are against God and turning back to God and the coming of God's realm known as the kingdom of heaven. We also discover in Matthew that when Jesus' ministry is threatened, he sometimes withdraws to a place of relative safety. Look with me at verse 12 of Matthew chapter 4 again. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew and anachoreo, anachoreo, that's the Greek word for it. He withdrew to Galilee, anachoreo. This verb is used multiple times in Matthew's gospel whenever there's a movement from one location to another in the face of threatening circumstances. For example, after following the star to Bethlehem, the Magi left Anacoreo for their own country by a different route, having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod. You all remember that? Jesus' parents went to Egypt, Anacoreo. After the angel warned them to flee, and they went away to Galilee, Galilee Anacareo, upon their return after a similar such warning in a dream. Go to Galilee. In chapter 12, Jesus departed from the synagogue, Anacareo, after becoming aware of a threat against him by the Pharisees. It wasn't his time. He needed to depart. Later in chapter 14, after John had been killed, Jesus departed Again, the word anachoreo, to a deserted place to be alone. So verse 12, which introduces our text today, is not there by accident, but rather to reflect the choice that Jesus makes to distance himself from threat. Of course, later in Matthew's gospel, we will see Jesus make a conscious choice not to retreat, but rather to face head on the threat that will come, which of course will result in his crucifixion. So what else do we learn about the person and the ministry of Jesus in Matthew's gospel? Well, and this is very important, we find that the light of Christ is manifested and demonstrated among his followers. In other words, Jesus is never named or refers to himself as the light of the world in Matthew's gospel. Instead, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, you are the light of the world. His followers, you are the light of the world. The followers of Jesus are the ones who bear his light by his, with their very own lives. And it is from this realization that we find, as Dr. Audrey, Audrey West suggests, the call to Jesus and to follow him is a key understanding in Matthew's gospel. That Jesus calls people as they are, where they are, and being who they are. So let's take a look again at our text for this morning. As Jesus walks beside the water, the soon-to-be disciples are engaged in their everyday lives. They're earning a living for themselves and their families by fishing in the Sea of Galilee. They're a pretty scruffy band of fishers, but that doesn't bother Jesus one iota. He doesn't require them to shower before do, joining his mission. Nor does Jesus ask questions about their credentials or their training or their required skill set. To Simon and Andrew, Jesus promises to expand their vocational skills. These men who cast nets for fish will one day be catching people. As for James and John, they receive only a call to follow. There are no hints of what's going to follow. There are no details. There are no promise of success. And amazingly, in our text today, all four of these people, just as they are, leave their nets and follow Jesus. As they are, from where they are, and being 
who they are. They are far from perfect as we will learn throughout the Gospels and the meaning of their choice will unfold only over time. Choices. One of the beautiful things about being human is that we all have the ability to make choices. And though we may think of Jesus as predestined for every single thing he did every single day of his life, that somehow Jesus had no choice, we need to realize that Jesus certainly did make choices along the way. After he was baptized and then went through many temptations in the wilderness, Jesus might have preferred to stay a while, whereas Matthew tells us the angels came and waited on him. But when the news comes to him about John's arrest, Jesus makes a different choice. He chooses Anacareo. He chooses to withdraw from the area that John has been preaching and baptizing and go to Galilee a long way away. So he calls his first disciples there. He preaches his sermon on the mount. He begins his ministry of healing, and he teaches what it means to be the Messiah as being God with us. And for those first disciples who might have been had preferred to keep their jobs, to may, remain with their families and stay with the life that they know, have made a different choice. They choose to take a risk, to step out in faith, to leave behind that which was comfortable and secure. They choose to follow Jesus. Now, not all of us are, are called to leave our nets to leave our livelihoods and families in order to follow Jesus. In fact, I now believe that there are very few people who receive that specific kind of call. But make no mistake about it. All of us in some way are called to follow Jesus. As we are, where we are, being who we are. Amen? I mean, even this morning... I love this. One of my favorite things in the world to do is children's dedication because it reminds us that as parents and church community, we make promises and we commit ourselves to invest in the lives of these three little boys as we acknowledge our call by Jesus to do so. Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, Jesus says, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Yes, following Jesus is something we are all called to do. And you know, as a senior adult who never now looks back, I do look back, I look back at uh, this close to 50-year-old letter to my parents, and I wonder what in the world were they thinking as they read those words? I mean, were they amazed? Were they worried? (laughs) Had they thought I had lost my ever-loving mind? (laughs) I think they may have thought a little bit of all of those and some more. But I am so grateful for their constant love and support to give their teenage daughter the space to continue discerning where and what Jesus' call for my life would lead me. As I concluded that letter to my family all those years ago, here's a little bit more of what I wrote. I don't want you to think that I haven't thought about this or prayed about it a lot. My life is not in my hands. It is in God's, and I have to live by faith in him. I have a peace of mind now, and I'm not worried about where I'm going to go or what I'll be doing. The only way my life will work is to have complete trust in God and listen for his call. Because when I listen to God and follow Jesus, I am a complete person. Christ lives in me. And that gives me an urge to press forward and spread God's word to others so that they have the same opportunity to experience that same kind of life, too. And then I wrote, and I quote, here I go preaching again. (laughs) I guess God already was getting me ready for a calling I hadn't even considered when I was 17 years old. Never seen a female minister in my entire life. That was not even a possibility. Missionary was a possibility. Preacher was not. But yes, indeed, we may not know the fullness of God's call at any one point in our lives. I don't even know where my calling will end. And here's the really good news. We don't have to. 
We don't. Instead, the question for us today is this. Jesus says, follow me. What will I choose to do with that call? There's a great song from the 1973 musical Godspell called Day by Day. And throughout my life, I have tried to live by its words, sometimes successfully, more often than not, not so much. But I still try because it reminds me that following Jesus is not a one-time choice. It's not saying magic words that save us, but then requires nothing else from us. Instead, following Jesus is a day-by-day choice that you and I are invited to make. Do you remember the words? Day-by-day, day-by-day, oh dear Lord, three things I pray. To see thee more clearly, love thee more dearly, follow thee more nearly, day by day. To see, to love, to follow. These are choices that we get to make each day of our lives. Will the choice we make to follow Jesus require sacrifice? You better bet you it will. Choosing to follow Jesus means that you and I lay down some of our wants and comforts for the sake of being a light to the world in his name. But the life that we receive as we step into God's realm, the will and the way of God for your life and mine, is a life filled with abundance of love and grace and acceptance beyond our imagining. And so I pray for you and for me that we will ask God to help us with these three things, to give us eyes to see God and the world God so loves, not only in nature, but also in everything and everyone within it, to give us a heart that loves God completely and loves others as God's love fills us to overflowing, and finally, to give us the ability to draw close to God so that you and I will continue to be able to discern the way God shows us to live, to love, and to follow Jesus wherever God leads us. To see thee more clearly, love thee more dearly, follow thee more nearly, day by day by day by day by day. This is what it means. To follow Jesus. And the people of God said, Amen and Amen. amen.